Yeah, let's praise God for what he's doing. He is alive, he's at work, and there's so much evil, there's so much destruction going on out in the world, but God is using his church to be a light in the middle of that storm, to bring people to salvation, to raise up a generation. We're in week two of this series called Momentum, and for those of you who were with us two years ago, we were in a vision called Greater Things. And right now we're celebrating what God has done these last two years, and we're also saying we're going to go pedal to the metal to just keep moving forward in the work of God in our time. Now you might be asking, yo, John, why do we need another vision series? You know, the two-year thing went, well, can't we just kind of coast? Can't we just, you know, take a break? The reality is that our world needs Jesus more than ever. And on this Mother's Day weekend, we're going to be reminded that our kids and our grandkids and our spiritual kids as a church family, we've got more than 2,000 spiritual kids here, they need Jesus more than ever. So if you look on your seat, you'll see these cards. And if you're at home, you can text the word vision to us. We'll get you these online. We can also mail them to you. And there's three groups of people that God has called us to as a church. You know, we exist to connect people to Jesus, and of course we want to do that for the whole world, but to be successful, we've got to narrow in on some specific targets. Our first target is Indiana. You know, God has placed us here for a reason, and Indiana, the people around us, need Jesus more than ever. Uh, we see this in the homicide rate in Indianapolis. We see this that there are you know, shootings further and further out into rural and suburban areas where we never thought they would be. Our neighbors need Jesus more than ever. That's why we continue with an urgency in the work that God has given us. But the second group that we're called to is the next generation. It's our kids and our grandkids. They are growing up in a turbulent, divided, chaotic world. And they need the stability of Jesus. They need the hope of eternal life. They need the promises of God in this life more than ever. So if you look at your next card, it's this blue card, and it's the same three groups. And it's saying, here's our calling as a church. First of all, we're called to maximize and multiply followers of Jesus right here in Brownsburg, Hendricks County, spreading all throughout central Indiana. Secondly, we are called to raise the strongest generation. And while probably um, many churches would say that, we as a church are putting a stake in the ground to say this is the very center of our vision as a church. This is our future as a church, is our kids and our grandkids. Well, on this Mother's Day, I want to just talk a little bit about how and why we're going to raise the strongest generation. But I do want to pause to say a happy Mother's Day. I know we've already celebrated you moms and grandmas in the service, and we'll continue to. I also do want to remind you there are genuine spiritual moms and grandmas. Uh, there's a, a woman of God who has no kids, no grandkids. She's never been married. She's never had any kids who paid for my entire seminary education. She's a spiritual mother to me. And if you're here and you're thinking, well, this next generation thing, it just doesn't really fit me. I don't have kids or grandkids. I want to encourage you. God has spiritual kids and grandkids for you if you'll be intentional. Uh, but to all of us who are investing in the next generation, and specifically to our moms, our grandmas, those women of God who are being intentional to be spiritual moms, can we give one more round of applause? If you're at home, surround your mother with applause right now. We love you, moms. We thank you for what you're doing. It was so fun this morning. While I was up early getting ready, Zoe and Evie woke up, and they wanted to make mom breakfast in bed. And it was so fun to see them uh, just carrying on the same selfless love, the same acts of service that they see modeled by their mom. I got to tell you a couple funny stories about my wife, Mel, and our daughter, Zoe. Here they are. Zoe's nine years old. We've got this game that we play at home. A lot of times when I get home from work, if it's around dinner time after we eat, Zoe will crawl underneath the kitchen table, and she likes to pretend that she's mom. Mom sits at the kitchen table, and Zoe will talk, and mom mouths the words and tries to keep up with whatever Zoe's going to say. And I'll usually record it, and then Zoe will pop up from under the table and watch it, and she just thinks it's the funniest thing. Well, we were doing this the other day, and I was saying, you know, Mel, your voice sounds different, and, 
And Zoe was trying to say there's something wrong with my vocal cords, but she keeps saying my Velcro cords, like the Velcro on your shoe. It was so funny, I just wanted to show it to you guys. Go ahead and take a look. Hey, I hear you humming, babe. Oh, um, yeah. You sound a little different to me. Really? Yeah, I don't know, you sound kind of like a nine-year-old girl. Your Velcro cords? Yeah. Your Velcro cords are broken? Yeah. <laughs> How do you spell Velcro cords? Is, is that like the same kind of stuff you use on your shoes instead of shoelaces? Velcro no, cords? No, 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 never in a thousand bajillion, ten years. What kind of cords are in your throat then? Well, there's a, a little glimpse for you of how goofy our family is. But I got to tell you another story about Zoe, because this just happened on Tuesday night. Uh, we were all asleep. It was like three in the morning, and there was this loud crashing noise. And it woke both me and Mel up. And you know how we all have innately wired into us fight or flight? It's just in our genetics. Well, for Mel, it's fight. And I can laugh now because at 3 a.m. we hear this loud crashing and we're like, is someone in the house? And it was kind of scary at the time, but now we can laugh because no one was in the house. Mel jumps out of bed and her throat is like still asleep, but she's just like, who's there? Who's there? And, and she just runs straight to the kids' bedrooms, just like in her as a mom. And I'm laying there thinking like, well, if there is someone out there, Mel's toast, you know? <laughs> I'm going to kind of come up with a strategy here. <laughs> so uh, we, we go down because then Zoe's awake. Zoe was actually woken up, not, not by Mel's response, but also by the crashing noise. The other two were sleeping right through it. Zoe had been having some kind of dream, and she's telling us there's a man in here. Uh, and it's that moment, like you, you're just waking up, it's 3 a.m., you hear this crashing noise, and you're like, my, my kid is probably just a little loopy because they're sleeping and having a dream, but then it kind of dawns on you, like, what if there is a guy in here somewhere, you know? And I remember going around the house, checking all the different areas to make sure that no one was there, and, and I remember this kind of moment as Zoe kept saying, there's, there's someone in here. Eventually, I find this shelf that had fallen off the wall because some idiot didn't use drywall anchors. And that's all that it was, was, you know, a poorly mounted shelf falling off of the wall. There was no, you know, intruder in the house. But I remember that feeling of protectiveness, of fear. Uh, can you relate to that feeling as a parent or as a grandparent where that person you love more than anyone in the world, they're in danger and you just have this, this feeling, this protective feeling? You know, we bring our children into the world, and when we have this little child, they're this innocent, vulnerable little baby. And we've got these amazing dreams for their life, and as life starts to move, different things threaten those dreams and threaten their well-being. And the reality is, statistically, all of our kids are much less likely to ever have an intruder in their room at three in the morning uh, than they are to fall for an idea about what they believe about themselves or God that leads them to decisions and behaviors that trap them in addiction or lead them into a dead-end life. And this idea of parenting and protecting our kids it gets a lot more complicated than just making sure no one sneaks into the house at night, though that's a good start as well. You know, United States teenagers, this last week, I spent a lot of time researching what are our kids up against? You know, I graduated from high school in the year 2000. So that was 21 years ago now. So I'm like turning into a dinosaur, okay? In those 21 years, the, the world that our teenagers are growing up in has rapidly, rapidly changed. Uh, did you know that just within the last 10 years, the rate of teen suicide has increased by 60%. So young people in America are more likely to die from teen suicide than they are from cancer. Uh, did you know that the use of marijuana, now that this is all nationwide, one out of four high school seniors is regularly using marijuana, many of them vaping it. 
40% say they've used it at some time in the last year. Get this, one out of 10 eighth graders nationally says I've used marijuana. And you might be like, oh, John, you're such an old codger. Why do you care? You know, loosen up. Here's the reality. When I was a journalist profiling heroin addicts, meth addicts, uh, addicts who were dying, every single one of them I profiled started with marijuana when they were in high school. It's a huge deal because the brain isn't fully formed. And, and whether it's marijuana or media content that the brain is not ready for, it affects the decision-making processes, it affects the identity, it affects the young person for the rest of their life. And so I'm not up here to say everyone panic, we all have to, you know, but we got to be aware of the world we're trying to raise our kids in. It's a hypersexual world with the media that they're exposed to. If you look any time at the top 10 songs and just look up the lyrics and say, this is, these are the words that my kids are memorizing. This is the world that they're growing up in. It's way different than the world we grew up in. And while these things are right around them, friends they know at school doing this and asking them to, these things are all around them. They're also growing up in this larger context of a world that is shaking and divided. They're growing up at a time of racial and national division that is very uh, announced and pronounced and very difficult even for adults to navigate. They're also growing up in a world where there's not really a set standard of right and wrong anymore. Everywhere they look, it's kind of like, well, who's to say what's right or what's wrong? And it's this kind of like, uh, you know, m morality by the voting of social media. If everyone says it's bad, it is. But if everyone says it's not, it's not. On top of that, we know from the Pew Research Center, this has been going on now for about 15 years, that each younger generation of Americans is abandoning Christianity at an alarming rate. A two out of three young people nationwide raised in Christian homes will abandon or walk away from the faith sometime between their 18th birthday and their 29th. That's the nationwide trend. So in such a world, how do we raise our kids to have lifelong safety and well-being? Right, this is why we want them to know Christ and be Christians. is isn't like you have to agree with me because otherwise you're going to hurt my feelings. We know that the power of Jesus sets us free from sin and addiction. The power of Jesus gives us the ability to have uh, marriages that most of us wouldn't have without him. The power of Jesus frees us from danger, and it also gives us eternal life. So how in such a world can you give lifelong safety and well-being to your kids and your grandkids. And by lifelong, here's what I mean. If we teach them how to navigate the world on their own, then someday when we die and they're adults, they're still going to know how to navigate the world. How do we teach them in such a way? How do we train them up in such a way so that when we're not around to clean up the mess or fix the problem, they've learned how to find the answer in the word of God. Well, God's got a powerful answer to this question as we continue studying in the book of Joshua this story of God's chosen people and that God had a plan, a generational plan. He had a plan for the grandparents, for the parents, and the grandkids. And we find ourselves, uh, it's actually in the book of Numbers, it's recorded that God's people, they've walked by faith and God conquered their enemies in Egypt. They've walked by faith now through the desert, and they're right up to the boundary of the promised land. This promise is for them and their kids and their grandkids. This promised land has generational implications. But they get to this boundary, the Jordan River, and they send across 12 spies to go scout out the land. And the spies return, and the spies more or less say, it's just like God said, I mean, it's bountiful. We could make an amazing life in this promised land, but there are giants in the land. There are fortifications. And here we are with this kind of ragtag tribe of people who've been living in the desert. We have no chance against these armed and fortified giants. And the people of God are going to have to make a choice. Will they have bold faith in the promises of God and cross over the Jordan River into the promised land? Or will they see the facts through a lens of fear, 
a lens of apathy, a lens that says, well, you know, promised land would be good, but we're making do over here in the desert. I'd rather not face any giants. And that's the decision that the people of God have to make here in Numbers chapter 13. This was the report that the spies sent to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore. It is everything God said, a bountiful country flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. They brought back samples. And then they say this, but the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants. Now, there is a spiritual principle here. When you step out in bold faith to obey God, financially or with your time, or saying, I'm going to be intentional with my kids and actually have them in the house of God or with God's people every week, uh, that's a lot like when the Israelites left Egypt. Every bold faith step eventually leads to a Jordan River of another bold faith step. And my prayer for you as a family, for us as a church, is that we would keep taking bold faith steps. Because what's going to happen is these spies who are negative, they're going to spread a bad report. Here's how it goes. Uh, Caleb tried to quiet the people, verse 30. Once the 10 spies, there's 10 who say it's just impossible. And they start to spread this around and the whole nation starts to say, oh, there's no way we could defeat those kind of people. There's two men that have faith, two leaders, Joshua and Caleb, and Caleb tries to quiet the people. He says, let's go at once to take the land. We can certainly conquer it. Yeah, it looks impossible, but look what God did with Pharaoh. Look what God did with Egypt. It would be impossible without God, but God's with us. So let's go for this thing. However, verse 31, the other men who had also explored the land disagreed. In other words, they lacked faith. They said, we can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. And then the whole community began weeping aloud. They cried all night and they said, why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones, the next generation, will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better? Let's not take a bold faith step forward. Let's actually retreat back to where we came from and go back to slavery because we're just too intimidated. We're too afraid. What happens is that this generation chooses fear over faith. And it's going to have implications for their kids and their grandkids. Now think about this. At this moment, when they say, now we're not going to do it, God then, he closes the door for a generation. And for 40 years, 40 years, this generation will sit there in the desert, one river crossing away from their destiny and their promise, but the door closes because they lack faith. Now here's the thing. When that door closed, there were newborns that week. They're going to go from birth to age 40 growing up in the desert. They could be growing up in the promised land. There were nine-year-olds like Zoe at this moment. And they're going to spend the next 40 years from age 9 to age 49 growing up in the desert instead of in the promised land. Not because God wasn't faithful, but because their parents and their grandparents said, ah, that's just too big of a step. It's too bold. Here's what God's teaching us today. Bold faith is the key that unlocks God's promised land for our kids. Promised land is a, it's a metaphor for God's best, for his destiny. Of course, there's the ultimate promised land of heaven that when we place our bold faith in Jesus' work on the cross, that's what gets us access into heaven, not our good deeds. But just like God's chosen people here, we are chosen people of God in this world and there are promised land type destinies for your family, for every Bible believing church, that we either cross the Jordan River and we seize those, or we back down, we settle into comfort and apathy, and we miss out on them. You know, it was a violent and thirsty world, but God had a promised land. And in the violent, thirsty world that we live in, God has a promised land for our kids. You know, three observations. I'm not going to put them on screen, but just as I studied this, that I thought of similarities. First, our kids and future leaders are surrounded by enemies. Raising them for God may seem impossible or at least intimidating at times. 
right? These parents, they're probably thinking, we can't go claim this land because how are we going to take kids with us into battle? But they're, they're, they were so focused on the enemies behind them and ahead of them that they just kind of froze in place. We could do the same thing if we're not careful. Secondly, God has a promised land destiny for our kids, but it includes battles and challenges. For the generation that will eventually go take the promised land, they are going to have to fight against those giants, those fortified cities. But just like the walls of Jericho, God's going to be with them if they step out in bold faith. And then the third thing is what we're looking at on screen. Our bold faith or our lack of faith can make the difference between a desert or a promised land for our kids. Your faith choices matter for your kids and your grandkids. Your faith choices can make the difference. Now, they're each going to have to choose for themselves. Do they believe in Jesus? Do they submit to God? But whether they're choosing that in a spiritual desert or in a spiritual promised land, you have incredible control over that with your choices. It's interesting that God planted this story in his word to show us that a lack of faith, a lack of obedience can trap a generation and their kids in the desert. I mean, think about that. We don't, we don't want to think about that, do we? I'm looking at you guys. You're like, yeah, this is making me uncomfortable. Our faith has implications for our kids. Bold faith, on the other hand, is going to lead the next generation across that river into that promised land, and it's going to have a positive implication for their kids and grandkids. Well, we are a movement that has had bold faith, and we're continuing to lean forward with bold faith. And we've got a specific vision for our next generation, one that says we're going to continue to invest in the fruitful kids' city and student ministries that we have. We're going to keep maximizing them. But we're also aware of this really vortex of a world that our kids are growing in up in, and we're going to be even more intentional. And so uh, to capture that vision, we actually asked some of our students and kids to come in. The first student you're going to see is my age. He grew up here. He's now a medical doctor who loves Jesus and is serving God in his practice because you all raised him up. And I want you guys to see why we have a bold faith right now, what we're doing and where we're going, let's go ahead and take a look. The success, freedom, and spiritual well-being of our kids and grandkids lies at the center of our vision and the calling as a church. We are growing up in a divided and turbulent world. But God has prepared you as a church to raise us. To raise us. To raise us. To know our identity in Jesus. To know our identity in Jesus and thrive in living for Him. And living for Him. We have a proven legacy of raising our students to be devoted followers of Jesus. Devoted followers of Jesus. You've invested millions in our kids' city and student ministries. Kids' city and student ministries. And God has blessed those efforts. Today, a generation of Connection Point kids have grown up and are living for Jesus as doctors, teachers, entrepreneurs, missionaries, attorneys, coaches, moms and dads in every walk of life, living out God's character with compassion, love, and integrity. As a church, we'll keep building on this legacy so that our generation can thrive for Christ, thrive for Christ, in a world opposed to our faith and freedom. Our faith and freedom. Nationwide, two in three of us raised in Christian homes are quitting Christianity. By age 29, our church has defied this trend, but now is no time to coast. No time to coast. No time to coast on yesterday's success. On yesterday's success. Our vision is to follow every kindergartner in our church all the way to age 29. Doing everything in our power to continue being a church. To continue being a church that defies the trend. We step into this vision in faith, believing that God will work in our hearts and shape our minds as we connect to his heart, his hope, and his word. Because my generation, my generation, my generation needs Jesus more than ever. More than ever. More than ever. We're going all in to raise the strongest generation. Yeah, let's just, if you're all in, would you clap with me, even if you're at home, and just say, I'm all in for that. 
I'm going to be part of that. Whether it's your own kids and grandkids biologically, or all of us as a movement saying our spiritual grandkids, this is what we're committed to. And if you look at the sheet of paper that's on your seat, again, if you're at home, you can text the word vision to us. I'm not going to read this whole document, but this explains a little bit more of what this next layer is. And I'll just read you a few key sentences. We resolve to keep building on this legacy. We will add deeper training and experiences for our kids and students to help them thrive as Christians in a world increasingly opposed to their faith. With the momentum vision, we're going to add layers of worldview training. What is worldview? Worldview is the lens. Every one of us has a worldview, and we see the whole world through that lens. And it's that lens that brings you to the conclusion of, was that right or was that wrong? Was that good or was that bad? And right now, there are a lot of competing forces to shape the worldview lens of our young people. By the way, the average adult in America in their 70s, researchers have found their worldview lens was framed between the ages of 10 and 17. And so the, the decisions, when, when we're all in heaven and our kids are deciding, what do I do? Is this good or is this bad? Those decisions will be based on the lens that they get formed right now. So we're going all in on worldview training. That includes biblical literacy, that they know the word of God. Identity formation. Who are they according to God? All of these things exist to ground our young people in a spinning world. Our vision for worldview training will, in time, offer every kindergarten to 12th grade student in our church specialized experiences. These are things you'll be able to opt into as a parent. Training them and preparing them for the world that they will inherit. This vision will weave things like mission trips, serving experiences, and Christian identity formation. Who am I? Not according to my peers or what anyone says on social media, but who am I according to God? With biblical worldview education, real-world conversations about the cultural and moral challenges that they're facing. We're going to follow our high school graduates through their college years all the way to age 29 so that this 18 to 29-year-old drop-off nationwide, we're being intentional to shepherd and guide our young people through those young adult years. Why are we doing all this? Because the next generation needs Jesus more than ever. So how can you join us in this? I'm going to give you three ways, and then I'll show you what they look like. Join us by serving. Serve anywhere in the church consistently, and your kids are going to see that believing in Jesus isn't just something that I add on to the American dream life. Following Jesus is at the center of my life. And if this is on your heart, you can serve specifically in kids or in student ministry. We perform background checks on everyone who serves in those areas. We train them. Uh, but we've got many adults here who've grown in their faith radically because they're serving with our kids or students. How else can you join us? By being consistent. We as a tribe are crossing over another Jordan River. We need you to be with us. And I would say to you, in this era where everything is so uncertain and unstable, your kids need you to have a fixed church home. So whether it's Connection Point or another Bible-believing church, you got to pick a church where you say, I'm loyal and I'm consistent so that my kids can have one consistent thing in the world they grow up in. Also, if you come to church once a month or two or three times a year, God loves you. We love you. You're always welcome here. But it's not going to change your kids, okay? you got to be here regularly. you got to actually be consistently around God's people for your kids to see that it's changing you and for it to change them. Third is giving. I mentioned earlier my spiritual mother, a woman named Diane, who paid for my entire seminary education. I would not be up here standing. I would not know how to teach the word of God if not for her financial giving that trained me as a spiritual son of hers. And so this is why those of us who are giving were praying about God. Uh, allow me to keep giving at an elevated level. God, would you have me give at even a more elevated level? Or those of you who aren't yet part financially of what God's doing, this Momentum series is a time where you can join in if God leads you to do that. Well, let me just show you a little bit of what serving and being consistent look like. Here's a picture of Kid City. If you've never been in there, by the way, you're giving, built, and maintains in excellent condition uh, a number of rooms like this. This is just one of them. 
And up front here is Jeff Skaggs. And as you get involved in kids and students, you're going to meet Jeff eventually. Uh, Jeff, believe it or not, just started attending church in 2013. And at the time, he would say he was not in great spiritual health. But he heard a message about serving, and he and his wife started serving in kids, and now they've served in a bunch of different areas. And Jeff has grown through some growing pains, through growing opportunities. Here's a picture of him with one of his many small groups of middle school and high school guys. There's Jeff there. I was asking Jeff to describe his serving journey for me, and he said, John, I'm actually an introvert with high anxiety. I thought, how? I see you everywhere, like smiling and helping people. And the point is, Jeff stepped over a Jordan River of his own to say, I'm going to serve. And from 2013 until now, him serving consistently has reshaped him, reshaped his family. If you want your kids or your grandkids to really get it, what it is to follow Jesus, I can tell you dads like Jeff and moms like Shirlene, their kids get it because their parents are serving and they're being consistent. You know, Jeff's reality of what he has done and what God's doing through him proves this point that we are raising a generation that defies the trends. And here's the thing. The freedom, prosperity, and peace of our children and grandchildren, it depends on our decisions today. The freedom, prosperity, and peace of our children and grandchildren depends on our decisions today. So this isn't just like, well, do I want to serve? Do I want to give? Do I want to be consistent? It's like, you know, I mean, I think of Zoe, who's nine. 11 years from now, she's going to be 20. I can't believe it. You know, nine years from now, she's going to be 18. Like, these years go so fast. And we have this tribe, this movement, where you don't have to figure it all out from scratch. We've got families here who are a little bit ahead of you to help you figure it out. Or maybe you, your kids are off to college and they're doing well. Don't coast now. Help us younger parents. We need you guys coaching us, helping us, giving and serving alongside of us. Well, this next generation in Joshua chapter 1, remember 40 years in the desert. After the 40 years pass, God calls up a new leader, Joshua. And he says, now is the time. I want this next generation, those newborns who are now 40, those nine-year-olds who are now 49, now I want you guys, I'm going to give you a chance to choose bold faith. I want you guys to cross the Jordan River. And this is part of how God works in history. Every generation has to choose for itself. That's what we're doing right now, whether or not we realize it. We're choosing now, and 40 years from now, there will be one of these kids and students that we're raising up who will be on this stage, and they'll be choosing Every generation has to choose. Verse 3, God says, when you step out in bold faith, I will keep my promises. And for Joshua, this meant wherever you set foot, you will be on land that I have given you. And that is just a verse that I have been claiming as I pray over the future of our church and pray about our young people. Saying, uh, God, it is the power of Jesus. You said you will build your church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. We desire to raise a spiritually strong generation. We're setting foot in that territory. And God, we're claiming that territory, uh, not just for us. We're claiming it for your kingdom, for your glory, that our kids and grandkids would grow up to love and serve you. Verse 5, God says this, when you're doing my work in bold faith, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. Why? Because I will be with you. These promises are going to lead to them getting to Jericho, most fortified ancient city of its time. And being like, There's no way we could defeat this city. And God's saying, well, I've got a plan. Just march around it seven times and I'll knock the walls down, right? We know there will be battles ahead. There will be fortifications ahead, but God will be with us. And no one will be able to stand against us as long as Christ is the head of the church and as long as his word is our guide. And we're saying, God, we are all in to do your work in this world. That's why God says in verse 6, be strong, be courageous. Don't be passive or timid. We can't be passive or timid about raising a generation for Christ in this world. we got to be strong. we got to be courageous. We're going to possess the land that God has given to us here in central Indiana and in the next generation. Well, in your small group study guide, there's a bunch more steps here. I won't have time to unpack them, but if you want to take a picture of these six steps or any week, 
You can go online. Our small group study guide has always a much deeper dive into the message, but I know you guys don't like me to preach for two hours, so that's why I do something like this and say, take a picture of this. But here's the reality. Do you want to take a bold step of faith for God in a way that will positively impact your kids and grandkids? You're going to have to cross some Jordan rivers. You're going to need a tribe. No one crosses a Jordan River on their own and succeeds. You're going to need God's promises and his presence. Let me show you what being consistent looks like. Here's one of our small groups. And in the back row, you've got the parents. This small group started about 20 years ago. And so these parents who've been in small group together for 20 years, they've got kids who were in diapers or who were kindergartners who are now college students. What have they done? Well, most of them serve, they give, but they've also been consistent here on weekends, but as a small group, consistent. And I got to tell you a story that I find so inspirational about what we are doing and can do as a tribe. Uh, one of these kiddos up front, I'm not going to point out which one, but there's one who's 22 years old, college student, and this kid is, or young adult, is facing a major life decision. You know, along the lines like, who do I date, or, you know, what do I do after college? And, and get this, because these small group couples are genuine friends, there was a Friday night where they were having a game night, and they're just playing cards at home, just hanging out, being in the body of Christ, just playing cards. Well, this kid, their parents were not there, but they're wrestling with this big decision, and they knew all my parents' friends, who I grew up in all their houses, they're having a game night. This 22-year-old drives their car intentionally to that house, goes and sits down at the card table with these other adults, not their parents, but their parents' friends, and more or less explains, here's the decision I'm thinking about, here's all the different factors what do you all think I should do? Man, I heard that story and I thought of Zoe at age nine and her at age 20 or 22. I thought, that's what I want for my kids. I mean, you, you can't buy that. You can't pay for that. You can't manipulate that. That when your child is a young adult and they're making decisions that could shape their whole life for better or worse, that they're intentionally going to mature followers of Jesus to say, what do you think I should do? That's why we be consistent. That's why we serve. Even if you're serving as a small group leader, you stick with it. You raise those kids together, and you are helping us as a tribe raise the next generation. I want to encourage you with this. We can raise a generation of God's chosen people, even in a world of violence and evil. We think our world's violent and evil. Well, the world that these kids grew up in was a world of actual hand-to-hand -hand combat with, you know, swords and bow and arrows. I mean, it was incredibly violent. And, and God's people were surrounded by total pagans on all sides. It was a very evil, dark world. But if God's people would choose bold faith, and when that generation did cross the Jordan River, they were able to raise their kids and grandkids to be God's chosen people, even in a violent and evil world. So again, three ways you can join us in this. If you're saying, yes, I'm actually all in. Start serving somewhere. Be consistent. Your kids and your grandkids need it. You need it. We need it. And join us financially. Because it ain't cheap doing the things that we're doing for our kids and our grandkids. Now, if you're newer with us, maybe it's one of these three things. If you've been with us for a while, maybe it's saying, you know, I'm actually going to start doing all three of these things. And I want to show you what the giving part looks like because you might think, well, giving, what does that really have to do with it? Well, it, it provides facilities like this. It provides the staff, especially specialist staff who understand that generation and what they're going through, what they're dealing with right now. I, can't, I couldn't believe, I still can't believe this. Yesterday I was at a soccer game and there was a middle school girl in our, in our church who told me that she actually watches the Daily Hope devotionals uh, at her lunch table on Fridays with her friends at school. And I was like, I gotta be like the oldest geezer to these middle school kids. I was telling her it'd be so cool uh, someday to have our students doing a Daily Hope devotional so that a middle schooler can see a junior or senior in high school say, hey, as your friends tell you what's cool or not cool, you need to know there's juniors and seniors at Brownsburg High School or Avon or wherever, Tri-West, who love Jesus and you're not alone in following Jesus. We're building a movement together and the giving allows all of that to work. 
And I just want to show you two people who are spiritual parents to me. Uh, this is Diane. Uh, Diane has never had kids. Uh, I don't think she's ever been married. I am Diane's son spiritually. And here's what I mean. When God got a hold of my heart and I left my, well, I was actually still working as a journalist, but I started going to seminary to, I was so curious about the Bible. And I, I reached a point where I didn't know how I was going to pay for that master's degree education. Uh, one day, Diane and I, we were walking to coffee. She was also a seminary student. And she said, um, John, every semester, I support a few students and pay their tuition. Diane ended up paying my tuition for my entire seminary education. The reason I can stand up here and teach the word of God and it be true to the word of God is because of this spiritual mom in my life. The, the dollars that she gave shaped me as a disciple. Uh, similar with Terry Moore. Terry Moore's a believer from where I grew up in Michigan, and I didn't come from a lot of resources. And Terry financially helped me launch out into life in a successful way. And, and so then later as I was deciding, do I believe this stuff? It's like, I think of what Terry invested in me. He's a Christian. There are some of you in this church family where maybe your seasons have changed in life. Maybe your kids are doing pretty well and they're raised and God wants you to be a spiritual mom or a spiritual dad. Maybe it's being here as a mentor. Maybe it's financially making it possible. Here's what I know. For a tribe to cross a Jordan River and seize and claim a promised land, it takes all of us. And it takes all of us being willing to do whatever we've been called and equipped to do. Each of us have resources and gifts that the rest of us don't have. And when we all say together, we're crossing this Jordan River together, that's when we seize what God has already claimed for us, the future of our kids and grandkids, the future of this movement in central Indiana. Are you guys with me in that? Can I hear it? Can, let's do it. Uh, why don't we stand up and I'm just going to pray this over us. Father, we want to claim your promises. Our hope is not in our strength. Our hope is not in our strategies. Our hope is in the God of the universe. A God who breaks down the walls of Jericho. A God who promises wherever you set foot, I will give that territory to you because I will be with you as I was with Moses. Father, we're gathered here and we're believing your promise when you said that you will build your church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Lord, we claim that promise. For every one of our kids and grandkids, Lord, we just, we see their faces in our minds, their names in our minds. We claim that territory for your kingdom. God, would you capture their hearts? Would you shape their identity to know that who they are is a daughter or a son of the King of Kings? Not what their friends say or what anyone else says. God, we pray with bold faith that 30 years from now, we'll each look back. Maybe some of us from heaven, some of us from here, but we'll look back. And we're going to see a generation of 30-year-olds, of 20-year-olds, of 40-year-olds who were raised as warriors of grace and truth. God, this isn't something that we can do in our own strength, but it is something that you can do as we choose a bold faith, a bold obedience. So Lord, show us what you'd have us to give. Show us how to be consistent. Show us where to serve. And Lord, uh, we just commit, we will obey you. Whether or not we have bold faith, it will show if we obey you. And so we obey you and we believe in you. We pray it in Jesus' name.